At this time, I'm kind of vacillating between what do I do now? I'm sick of prostitution. I'm so sick of stripping. I'm in pain. I'm an alcoholic. I don't know what to do. So I kind of just sat home for a few months and I got into the occult. And I had allowed so much satanic um, activity in my life that whenever time I looked at the moon, it would tell me to F off. And I thought it was crazy. And then I asked the neighbors, they're like, are you dabbling in the occult again or the Ouija board? I'm like, yeah, but the Ouija board tells me it's Jesus Christ. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was really demon possessed. Los Angeles, 1994. Up in the San Fernando Valley, the adult video business is booming. Chasey Lane is signed as Wicked Pictures' first contract star, and adult superstar Jenna Jameson makes her porn debut. But elsewhere in the Southland, close but yet so far away, the life of wannabe porn superstar Shelley Moore is out of control and spiraling downward. A full-blown alcoholic and drug addict, she's washing out of the porn business and struggling to raise her six-year-old daughter. Though she still supports herself as a prostitute and small-time con artist, things are rapidly going to pieces. Intoxicated daily, Shelley reads about New Age spirituality and sits for hours on end surrounded by white candles. She hallucinates that Satan is speaking to her through the moon and soon begins to believe she has developed psychic powers, including telekinesis. After weeks of this, Shelley finds herself low on cash and needing to, quote, pull a few deals. When she ends up at a bar called The Boar's Head in Covina, California, little does she know she's about to begin a brand new chapter in her life. So anyways, I'm a prostitute again, and I'm, I don't know what I'm going to do with my life. Now I feel like no man will ever want me. And all of a sudden, I go to a bar one night. I met a pastor's son in a bar. He asked me if he could buy me a drink. I said, yeah, whatever, whatever. You want to go out? Uh, no, I don't date, okay? I charge about 300 bucks an hour, and uh, I doubt you can afford that. He's like, no, really, I was, maybe we could go out and just play pool sometime. I'll play some pool. You buy me some drinks or something. I was all about, you got to give me something. I want drinks, drugs, money, something. And he's actually really sweet with me and says, hey, you want to go out sometime? I said, uh, no. And he goes, um, he goes, do you get high? I'm like, well, yeah, I do that. Now you're talking. I'm like, what do you got? Meth. He was a meth dealer, even though he was a pastor's son. I guess what had happened was his father when he was a pastor, fell to sexual sin and they had lost everything. He goes, oh, well, oh, we're having a bachelor's party. We need a stripper. <laughs> yeah, right. All right. You know, I looked at him right away and went, oh, this will be easy. That's an easy 300 bucks. Well, anyways, the guy kept calling me and uh, wanted to go out. So when I knew he had meth, I said, bring it on. I'll go out with you. I'll just use this guy for all his meth and we'll make him buy me drinks too. It was all about using men. Well, he started coming over to my house bringing all this meth and we'd be like, just snort it. And I began to stop working. I began to like not want to work as much and just spend time with this guy. He'd bring over checkers and cribbage. Next thing you know, this guy and me are sitting in my apartment up to like three in the morning playing checkers, getting high on meth. He comes over and goes, you want to play checkers? You want to play games? I'm like, games? I haven't played games since I was a kid. And we sit there like little kids. I'm going to win. I'm going to win. And, and he just really was my friend. And the only reason I really went out with him because he said he had meth. See, porn stars love drug dealers. We go together. But this guy started being really kind to me. He didn't pursue me sexually. I didn't understand. In fact, I, t I told him I thought he was gay. So what, are you gay or something? It's a sweet story in a twisted kind of way. But then the tale begins to take a surreal turn. He started coming over to my house bringing all this meth and we'd be like, just snort it. Next thing you know, we grab the Bible and go, Dude, look what Joshua did. 
No, really, like Moses really did part the Red Sea. Are you serious? No, what about Esau? And all of a sudden I'm like, oh my gosh, we're getting high in meth reading the Bible? Anyone who's ever been around tweakers knows that when they're spun on methamphetamine, they're not going to sit down and read a book. They're going to take their carburetor apart to make it work better. Um, it's also interesting to note that up until this point, Shelley's primary vices had been alcohol and cocaine. It's not until she takes up with Gary that she gets hooked on meth. And we started reading the Bible together. Just spending all this time together. And, I, and, and we just knew, you know what? I'm supposed to marry this guy. God's like, you're supposed to marry this guy. And I said, I don't love you, I'm not attracted to you, but I'll do it. I did it because God told me to. I didn't want to marry this guy. I did not love him. I didn't have the capacity to love anyone, not even myself. But I figured, like a good businesswoman, well, you got herpes and you got a kid who also doesn't want to marry you. Okay, so why'd she marry him? Because God told her to, or was it simply for opportunistic reasons? She's telling two conflicting stories at once. Then there's Shelley's account of the big day, their wedding at City Hall. Shelley writes, we drove to Norwalk, California on a harsh winter's day. However, historical weather data reveals that the daytime temperature range that day was between 54 and 63 degrees Fahrenheit. It's all about telling a good story. What is a con artist but a storyteller? Shelley freely distorts and overdramatizes everything because it's mythology filled with portents and omens. In her book, Shelley tells a quaint story about Gary early on in their courtship showing up at her house unannounced with rags to clean her house for her. It's part of the mythology, you know, the white knight with the sun behind his golden hair. Because we now know that in the spring of 95, cleanliness and godliness were not high priorities for either of them. After their wedding, the couple was living out in Chino in a condo that belonged to Gary's aunt. That is, until one day when Gary's mother and his aunt come to visit and they find the place is trashed. Shelley and Gary get thrown out and his aunt calls Child Protective Services on them. So Shelley calls her parents for help and they come to her rescue. The Moors put Shelley and Gary up in the family's 30-foot Alpha Gold fifth wheel camper. Her parents also forked out the first month's rent so the RV could sit parked in San Dimas. What did Shelley and her white knight do? They completely trashed the camper as well, to the point that her parents decided to sell it rather than get it repaired. By now the couple is in dire straits. They have no jobs, and they're addicts living on welfare. Shelley's mother suggests that Gary should join the army, because it'll make a man out of him. Shelley agrees and tells Gary he needs to enlist to support them. perfect. He has to sober up, but she can keep on getting loaded. Shelly wears the pants, so off he goes to basic training in Texas. Shelly had reasons of her own to want to get out of California. Seven outstanding arrest warrants. So after a little time in Glendora, she follows him to Texas and then later to Washington State. It's after their exodus from Southern California that Shelly begins her fabled recovery. Wait, you say you've never heard some parts of this story before? That's because we left out one little thing. Nearly everything we know about Shelley Lubin comes from her own accounts. That is, the differing accounts she's given over the years. And up until now, no one has come forward to challenge her versions of events. I began to wonder how much of the official story is verifiably true, how much is mythology, and what do we really know about Shelley Lubin? And then something really unexpected happened. I received a message on YouTube directing me to a page on howardstern.com. It was a recap of Stern's broadcast of November 9th, 2010, the day after Shelley Lubin had been a guest. An item near the bottom of the page carried the title, Shelley Lubin's Brother Disputes Her Story. We had a guest on yesterday named Shelley Lubin. If you remember, she was the woman who was in pornography. She was a prostitute, and she now has devoted her life to getting women out of pornography and prostitution, and she gave a rather touching uh, interview. She even talked about her parents and her problems there. Well, I received a letter from uh, Shelley's younger brother. He claims to be Shelley's younger brother. Okay. He says, I want you to know that what you heard today regarding our parents and the household we grew up in was not the truth. It's the truth Shelley has conjured up in her mind, but it's not the real truth. It's interesting that my other sister and I never considered a life in pornography or prostitution. She fails to mention that to people who interview her, 
just like she fails to mention all the times my parents rescued her from impossible situations. The reality is that Shelley was a very difficult child who needed huge amounts of attention. And she, he claimed she was diagnosed as being bipolar. I don't know anything about that. But uh, the family... Well, this is a whole family thing. It's a whole family thing. The tip had come from Shelley's brother, Chris. Chris and the Moore family are devout Christians, and their position is not in favor of pornography. But he was upset about the things that Shelley has been saying about their parents, which he knows to be untrue. For years, they tried to work this out within the family. The problem for the Moores, though, is Shelley doesn't seem to be interested in working it out or in publicly recanting her claims. So he dropped Howard Stern that note to try to vindicate his parents. When Shelley learned that Chris had contacted Stern, she sent him a message through Facebook. Furious, she threatened to publicly expose skeletons from his past. Shelley wrote, You want me to tell the public about your reckless teenage years? Don't you ever stand against the gospel of Jesus Christ again, or the Lord will rebuke you publicly. I forgive you, but the Lord is powerful in me, and he will not be stopped. You have done a terrible thing to the gospel of Jesus Christ and against my family. Heck, I don't even care about me or my family, but zeal for the Lord has eaten me up. Shelley closed with what sounds like a warning or a threat. Sometimes the Lord has to break our legs when we stray. He will now break yours. Her brother responded, Let me explain something to you. I'm not coming against your ministry. In fact, I quite like your ministry. I'm coming against you and your manipulation of the truth regarding our parents and how you were raised. You know what I think? I think you're believing your own hype. As long as you continue to trash mom and dad, I will contact every personality you contact and defend my parents. Shelley's response? Then let it be, Chris. Be the Judas. It's not just the incredible arrogance and the way she uses herself and the Lord almost interchangeably, but also the fact that she never once tells her brother he's lying. Chris challenged her story. She calls him a traitor, but she never tells him he's lying. Opposing her is his sin. Even challenging her is blasphemy. 